brief and only say nice things. <laughs> so we're very pleased to have Professor Shaul Hochstein with us today. Uh, professor uh, Shaul Hochstein is a professor at the Edmund and Lili Safra Brain Center of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His research and vision covers multiple domains from biophysics or phototransduction through electrophysiology or visual information processing, examining the visual hierarchy in a novel way uh, to psychophysics and cognitive psychology. He studies perceptual skill learning, conscious perception, memory, ensemble statistics, and actually anything that has to do with visual perception. He published many pa uh, papers in high, um, profile journals, including vision and attention journals, and his work is highly cited. He served as the director of the National Institute of uh, Psychobio Psychobiology in Israel and served in many roles in the academy on top of his research. He's the founding father of visual perception and perhaps even attention in Israel, having supervised many Israeli researchers that are now faculty in many universities in Israel and abroad. He's an ambassador of science in Israel and across the world, communicating science to the public. And I'm sure I've missed uh, many more details about um, your biography. And um, we're very pleased to have you. So welcome, Shaul, to our seminar. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. And sorry that it's not in person uh, at the lab at bar -Ilan. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Do you guys see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the subject I want to talk about today is the gist of false memory. Um, and um, first, my collaborators, Stefan Fusi, who works at Columbia University. I've begun a collaboration with him. I'll speak more about it. Marina Pavlovskaya is at the Lower Sign Rehabilitation Center. Uh, she's done work on some of the things I'll talk about, but uh, mainly things that I will not talk about. Uh, Noam Hayat is the one who did most of the work about the things that I will talk about. Uh, he's a PhD student at the lab after finishing a master's. Uh, and uh, Safa uh, Abbas Abu Rakab uh, is at the, from East Jerusalem, actually, and she's a um, um, occupational therapist at a Arab school for autism and um, has done some of the work that we're talking about today, she has done uh, with autistic uh, kids. Um, okay, so first the clarification. Uh, some of the work that Meirav Achisar and I did about reverse hierarchy, we got into a little bit of trouble. And I wanna mention it because I wanna mention something similar to what I'm gonna talk about today. We proposed the reverse hierarchy theory, which uh, I hope you all know, and if you don't, you better read the papers because it's the most important papers that have come out uh, um, this, uh, well, last century. Uh, and what we said was the following. Uh, a low area neurons respond to simple geometric forms in specific locations, while high areas represent objects, categories, generalizing over position and orientation, etc. You all know this, but what did we uh, suggest which was special? Early explicit perception, the things we know about first, is not what happens early in the visual hierarchy, but rather late in the visual hierarchy. We first know the result of a pre-processing high-level view of the gist of the scene, and later, Later, we get attention focused to specific details which are already there at low areas. So we actually process first going up the hierarchy, but we are consciously aware of the top first and then of the lower levels. Okay, so vision, uh, it divides, I can't place my thing. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this, but okay. Vision <laughs> with scrutiny is when conscious perception beginning at the high level representationally gradually extends down to already lower level details, which are there already. And I, yeah. Okay, so the gist of the scene versus its details, we, and since we know the gist first, it leads to a number of blindnesses, attentional blink, repetition blindness, change blindness, so and all come from this reverse hierarchy. And I'm gonna give you examples. So now you know, I need your responses so you can turn back on your mics, don't unmute yourselves, and I wanna hear your response to the following question. What is the difference between the following two pictures? 
Go ahead. I don't hear. Dog. Dog. Um, Dog. 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 And also stairs. The, the uh, staircase. Yeah. The window. The window. The, window. the, window. Yes. the, the, the shape, of the, uh, window. shape of the window. The shape of the window. Exactly. Okay. And so the, the first stairs. Thing, the first thing that everybody sees is the categorical difference between the dog and the flower. That's the gist of the scene. And we don't notice the details until we look carefully and we get the details. Okay. Does this imply that we should teach reading by the reading of words first and reading letters, letters later? No. And this is a question that many ask me when I give talks about reverse hierarchy theory. We are not trying to imply it. Similarly, when I'm going to talk about false memories, I do not wish to imply that later life reports of young age abuse are false memories. Okay? I just want that to be very clear. Okay. Now, a word about Stefano Fusi and his theory. Uh, together with Marcus Benner, they propose that information is compressed in the brain. The way information is uh, represented in the brain is through a compression mechanism, whereby first we represent the ancestor, what I'm gonna call, what he calls, of the information, and then the descendant. So if we have many ancestors, call them many categories or many essential shapes or whatever it is, and each one has descendants which are related to it, the way we represent that into the brain is the ancestor is represented by its detail but the descendants are represented only by which ancestor do they belong to and what is the difference between that descendant and the ancestor. In this case, this descendant is missing this, so it's marked as missing. It has this added, so it's marked as added. And this one has a different one missing and a different one added. So the differences between the, I'm gonna make this much clearer as I go along, but I wanted to say right at the outset that a lot of the work we've been doing has been influenced by this theory of Stefano, whereby he's saying that the way things are represented are via their ancestor plus the differences from the ancestor. Okay, false memories. Well, this is one of the typical ones Donald Trump said, well, look at how many people were there at my inauguration. Well, Barack Obama had much fewer. Well, the pictures tell you what the truth is. Freud talked about true and false memories. He changed his mind actually in mid-career. At first, he said the behavior of pa patients while reproducing infantile experiences, I can't see myself, is incompatible with the assumption that the scenes are anything less than a reality, which is being felt with distress and produced with great reluctance. So at first he believed all the stories, they must be all true. I believe their stories and constantly suppose that I have discovered the roots of subsequent neuroses in these experiences of sexual seduction in childhood. If the reader feels inclined to shake his head at my credulity, I cannot altogether blame him because I was at last obliged to recognize that these scenes of seduction had never taken place. They were fantasies which my patients had made up to cover up recollection of infantile sexual activity. Okay, so Freud realized that some things that we remember are not absolutely true. Okay. William James had said this already in 1890. False memories are no means rare occurrences. People have them, no doubt. And then he said, what is the source of false memory is often of the accounts we give to others of our experiences. We almost always make them more simple and more interesting than the truth. We quote what we should have said and done rather than what we really did or said. And then after a while, the fiction expels the reality from memory and reigns in its stead in alone. So we have these false memories, we all do, and partially it comes from our telling stories of what we've done in our lives. Kafka said in 35, what a strange storehouse we find memory to be. Things do not simply fall into the places into which they have been thrown. They arrange themselves into incoming and during the time of storage. They form groups and various sizes and kinds. Remember what Benna and Fuzi were saying, that things are organized with an ancestor and descendants. These are the groups that are being formed. Let's try an experiment. If you unmute your speakers that you can respond. Here's the experiment. So here are a group of circles. You can see them. And they're sized from number one to number seven. 
Got it? Okay. okay. So now the question is, what size is this? Three. 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 Two. Three or two. Four. four. Three, four, two. Okay. Well, now let's try it again. Between one and seven. What size is this? Five. Five, five maybe. So this was between <laughs> five and six. This was, oh, sorry. And this was between two and three. Saying that this was three or four or two, so what we do is we contract to the mean. When we try to judge something which belongs to a set, we always say it's closer to the mean than it really is. This is something which was found more than a century ago, 1910 by Hollingworth. We said that judgments of time, weight, force, brightness, extent of movement, length, area, angle size, all tend to gravitate towards a mean magnitude. We call of item parameters are falsely skewed towards the central value, okay? So I'm calling this a false memory, okay? This is something where we don't remember, we remember the group, we remember, and when we're asked about an individual, we say it's closer to the mean than it really was. Now, what about the DRM task? Uh, now, if we wanna try this, I'm gonna try this in Hebrew and then I'll try it in English, okay? So I'm gonna show you a list of words and you're supposed to remember all the words. Easy, right? Okay, what were the words? Emek. Thank you for saying har, because that was the thing. Har was not there. <laughs> That's the task. All these words have somehow related to har, but har was not there. And yet we remember that it was there. False memory. Okay, well, let's try it in English, okay? Ready, set, go. Remember all the words. Okay, words. Table. Table. Soft. Table. Sit. Cushion. Cushion. Soft. Soft. No, soft wasn't there, didn't it? Soft was there. Chair wasn't there. Soft was there. Rest. Yes. In, in fact, chair was not there. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Saying that chair wasn't there mean that it pulled up the word chair to your mind in any case. Okay, you want to try it again? Once oh, yeah, more, yeah. once more, write it. Okay. Happy. Emotion and rage. Emotion. Hate. Trump. Trump. Okay. And the word that was not there was anger. No, I didn't oh, wow. say By the way, the word mean was there. What does mean no. mean? Mean, middle. To be mean? Uh, exactly. In this case, it means to mean, to be mean, to be angry, because that's what it's related to here. Although in most of my talk, I'm going to be talking about mean being the average. Okay. This is the uh, DRM task. It was introduced by these. Uh, um, in 1959 and then followed by Rediger and McDermott uh, in 95 and 2000. And so it's known as the DRM paradigm. And what happens is that we remember a word that wasn't there if it's related to the words that were there. Again, a false memory. Okay. Um, Posner and Kiel said in 68, when presented with a set of distortions of a prototype, this is an experiment they did. They took shapes of dot patterns and so on, and then showed distortions of it, and we remembered the, the mean of them, okay? And Friedman, a blessed memory. Ah, uh, this is another experiment. Okay, this experiment, uh, they're going to be two uh, uh, numbers at the edges here and here, and you're supposed to remember those two numbers, okay? I'm going to show it very quickly. Remember the two numbers. Okay, what are the numbers? Five and two. Two and five. Two now, and between five. them, there are shapes. What shapes were there? Triangle. 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 Square. And circle. 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 
Okay. And what colors were there? Green. Yellow, green, green. Red. red, purple, blue. Now, what color was each shape? Blue. Triangle was green. Green, triangle. green. Green triangle. Green triangle. Green triangle. Okay. Green triangle. Okay. <laughs> Red so, and what happens very often is that you, when somebody said one of the shapes was yellow, it's because there's yellow here and yellow here. It's a conjunction. It's an illusory conjunction. Okay. And, and one of the things that uh, she said, actually, I only found it in a Scientific American paper by her. Um, she says, uh, oh, okay, we can try this. Let's try it first. Here's a list of words. Cucumber, carrot, tomato, forest, lake, desert, car, tire, bumper, okay? Now we're gonna do the same experiment again. Remember the two numbers, I have to know the two numbers on the two sides. Okay, what were the shapes and what were the colors of the shape? Uh, orange, orange triangle. triangle. Orange triangle. Light blue. Blue ellipse, I thought. So it was the light triangle blue. was blue. Good. So this <laughs> time we saw the carrot the lake and the tire. Oh. oh, this, okay. This is in the Scientific American paper by Andreessen, okay? Uh, you can look it up. Okay, so the next thing she says though, and, and this is the paper about illusory conjunctions with Hilary Schmidt, I'm sorry, it says still Schmidt. Uh, confidence and subjective experience. A final question concerns subjects' confidence in their reports. Did they really see the illusory conjunction or were they simply guessing? Did they identify the colors and shapes separately and then guess? No conclusive answer can be given, but the evidence seems consistent with our own conviction from pilot experiments that on some trials at least, illusory can have the character of perceptual experiences. This is not just guessing and guessing wrong. This is actually feeling that I did see that Red oval shape. Okay, so we've got here a list of true and false memories. False memory deriving from accounts, William James, contraction to the mean by Hollingworth, memories formed groups by Kafka, false memory of mean and prototypes of sets with the DRM paradigm, presented with the distortions, Posner and Kiel, and illusory conjunctions of Treesman. And I wanna talk about another false memory, which is set statistics perception. Ariely, we reintroduced this 2001 and many, many papers have come out in the meantime. And I'm gonna talk about papers that I've done mainly with uh, Noam Khayat uh, in 2018, 19 and one coming out now in 20. And the, the, the thing that we find is that when presented with a set of elements, either successively or simultaneously, we're unaware if we are presented quickly and so on of the individual values, but we perceive the mean and range, okay? This is true for high level and low level features. I'll give examples. This is Don Arielli. He showed subjects a bunch of circles on the screen and then asked them one of two questions, either was this circle there? And the second possible question was, is this circle bigger or smaller than the mean? And they did very well on the mean and very poorly on its being a member of the, of the circles. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. In other words, if these were the four sizes, they were just as well seeing that this size was there as the one in between the two, that's the mean. They were just as well between these two or, so it was just how far away it was from the mean, it was when they said it was there and it had nothing to do with the ones that were actually there. On the other hand, discrimination threshold for the mean, they're very good at it and there's as good when there's only one uh, uh, circle there or when there are many circles there, okay? Uh, again, uh, Sanchal Chung and, and Ann Treisman did the study in a slightly different way. They showed two groups of circles on the left and the right and asked which one uh, has the larger mean. And again, subjects are very, very good at doing this. Jennifer Corbett and Chris Orient, they showed it uh, successively rather than simultaneously, and we uh, followed them in doing it that way. Uh, th there's a very interesting thing here in that uh, when you're asked, um, you, you can be shown this test thing where you're asked, was it there or was it not there? Or you're asked, is it bigger or smaller than the mean? You can show this test one either after or before you show the series, okay? 
And if you show it before, and then you ask them, okay, I'm gonna show you now a series. Tell me if the mean is gonna be the same or different than this, or tell me, is it there or not? And in both cases, you get almost 60% correct. It doesn't matter if you're asked about the mean or the membership. But if you first show the series and then ask them, was this shape there? That's the memory identification. They're way down to below 50% or just 50%, let's call it. Or if you ask them instead, what does this mean? Is this bigger or better than mean? They're much better, okay? Now, why are they better? Uh, when they're shown this before, then uh, why are they better when shown it after than when shown it before, when you're asking about the mean? And why is the membership better uh, when shown before rather than after? Good question. So here's the answer. Uh, if you show because it- Because they look for it. When the... If you show it before, they just look for it. Okay, so it's easier if you know what to look for than if you have to remember them all and try and get it. But why in this case, when you're looking for the mean, is it better after? It's because when you're doing, looking at the series and trying to calculate the mean, the brain is calculated in some sense, whatever it is, then you're not worried by trying to also remember the test one if you're only gonna see the test after. So you calculate the mean and then look, is it equal to this? If you have to remember this while you're calculating, it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, okay. This works also for facial expression or emotion, okay? And you, they take a morph of uh, happy and a, a disgusted, sorry, uh, face, and, and then they, they show a set of them and they ask which one was there. And once again, it's without knowing which one was actually there, they're only between the mean and they get the mean very well, okay. What we added first was the question of, is this knowledge of the set mean something we do automatically and implicitly, or uh, is it something we have to think about and try and do? So what we did instead was to show a series of circles or lines or uh, brightness uh, uh, disks and ask the subject after they had seen this, which one was there, this one or this one? Which orientation was there, this or this? Which brightness was there, this or this, okay? So the only thing they were trying to do was to remember all the different sizes, uh, orientations, or brightnesses. So the mean should have no effect here unless it's done automatically, implicitly, and that they're gonna answer with a contraction to the mean. And that's what actually uh, is gonna happen. So if, the two test items are both within the range that we're showing, then we, okay, one was seen and one was new, and they're both in the range. That's what we're gonna call the baseline. And we expect if they can't remember anything, that would be 50%. But if the one that they saw was the mean, then they should choose it more often. That should be better performance. While if the one that's new is equal to the mean, in other words, the mean was not shown, it's an absent mean, they should do worse because they should choose the mean even though it wasn't there. And if the new one is out of the range, we're gonna show sizes like this and this, and the, one of the tests is way out, then they should do even better. And that's exactly what happens. The baseline is around 50%, they're remembering very little, but when the seen one was the mean, they do much better. And when the new one is the mean, they do worse. It means they recognize the new one instead of the mean, which is what they're supposed to be answering. And when the non-member, the, the new one is outside the range, then they do even more than 80% correct. So they know what the range is and they know what the mean is, even though they weren't asked to remember either one of those things. So, um, we want to know if this also works for something which is more high level. And so we went to categorization. What is categorization? Categorization is the ability to treat similarly, but non things which are similar, but not identical, okay? If we have seen a lion and the, we see now a slightly different kind of lion, it, we're gonna run away from it just the case. We don't have to know what this lion is. So we treat all lions similarly, or 
food, we, uh, whatever. Okay. There's nothing more basic than categorization to our thought, perception, action, and speech. Without the ability to categorize, we would not be able to function at all in a physical world. An understanding of how we categorize is central to our understanding of how we think and how we function, and therefore an understanding of what makes us human. Wow. Might it be more than this? Can all cognizing be a matter of a categorizing? Is cognition a kind of categorization rather than categorization a kind of cognition? Okay. This is just say that categorization is important. And so what we did was show a series of pictures, all from the same category, and then ask which picture was there. If they're both from the same category, fine, they should see the seen one or the new one. If the new one is from a different category, they should be able to reject it. And if the seen one was the prototype or the new one is a prototype of the category, they should choose that more often. In the same way, as we said before, for different objects of different sizes. So in category is the baseline. If one of them is the prototype, we should be better if it's the seen one and worse if it's the new one. And if from a different category, it should be still worse. And we get exactly the same type of responses. Now, in this case, they're all above 50% because they're remembering some of the pictures. Okay. And, and therefore, they're not depending only on the mean, on the prototype. But if the member is the prototype, they're close to 80%. If uh, neither is the prototype, it's just over 60%. If the new one is the prototype, then they're choosing it, but they're choosing the seen one, 53%, something like that. And if the new one is from a different category, they reject that very well. Okay. So we can now say that seeing the mean of, of a set of objects, whether it be low-level objects, uh, a low-level uh, um, parameters, features of size, orientation, etc., or category, what we do is on the fly, we can, uh, uh, we can do this performance of the mean and, and we can know what is the mean and what is, okay, and categorization is similar to set perception. But the way we did the categorization was a jump from something very low level to something which you might say, well, that's semantic. We look at the pictures and we know the name of the category, et cetera. And so following this idea of Stefano Fusi, we said, let's try these ancestor and descendants of categories, which are not categories that people know, but we're gonna make new novel categories. And we're gonna have different ancestors and the, and the ancestor determines what are the ones that are close to it. And we're gonna use those. So here are some of the shapes, we call them amoeba shapes. So we have the central one in each case is the ancestor and all the ones around it are distortions of that ancestor. And they're distorted in different ways. They're either rotated or stretched or, or enlarged or contracted and, and so on, okay? But you can see that each one of these ancestors is very distinctively different and yet all its descendants are similar and what we're gonna do is in exactly the same way, we're gonna show a series of pictures of the descendants or maybe including the, the ancestor and then ask which of two pictures was there. Again, you're supposed to try and remember which picture was actually there rather than, uh, okay. And, and I have a demo for you so you can try it out yourselves. Look at the center, different shapes. And now which one of the two was there? Left or right? Left. Okay. And here's another. Which was there? Left. Left. Okay. And that's very good. And now the question is going to be, will they do this better when one of those test things is equal to the mean? Okay. Okay. So we see, that we show the series and then we show two test items one of which was there and one of which is new, and maybe it's equal to the mean or maybe it's not equal to the mean and so on, okay? And what do we get? We get the same effects. Here's when the new is equal to the base, the, the ancestor or the mean, then they're choosing that more and therefore they're choosing the correct one less than 50%. They're a little bit above 50% for the baseline and they're above 50% when the new is equal to the mean. Or here's a better picture of it when the, this is, um, sorry, uh, when they're both uh, within the same, their descendants of the same category, both the new 
and the scene. And when the seen one is equal to the ancestor, they're choosing it more. And when the uh, it's less than less, okay? This is with 50 Amazon Turk. I never mentioned that all our tests are done with uh, Amazon Mechanical Turks so that we can do it online during Corona. Okay, so here are the three results for low level features, uh, size, um, orientation, and brightness. Here's for categories, and here's for amoeba shapes. So in every case, we get exactly the same kind of results that uh, when the test, one of the tests, the seen one is equal to the mean or the prototype or the ancestor, we're choosing it more often. When the new one is, we're choosing it more often and therefore we're getting more wrong and, and the same for categories. So therefore we feel more confident that categorization has a similar kind of mechanism underlying it as does set uh, ensemble perception. So interim conclusion, set mean and range and category prototype and boundaries are extracted from image and object sequences automatically and implicitly. Determining category membership is like determining if an item is close to the set mean and not an outlier. Experimental design similarity and result similarity suggest representations of low level features, high level object categories may share perceptual computational mechanisms. Okay. Okay, what is, I now ask, the impetus? What's the evolutionary advantage underlying mean prototype ancestor versus outline perception? After all, mean perception is another example of false memory. Just like contraction to the mean is false, just like remembering that a, a, a lure word was in that list when it's not really in the list, just trying to remember that shapes that we see we think we saw the prototype. Or when we see categories, we think we saw the prototype. That's all false memory. Why should we have in our brains a mechanism that gets us to have all these false memories? Okay, And maybe it is, and maybe it's not related to telling stories and seeing scenes and, and seeing witnessing things which are false memories as well. Is there a relationship between the things? So now I'm going back to Fuzi and Mena. And, and what they said was the following, that in order to represent items in memory, let's talk about categories. All we have to do is represent the category prototype. We know what a dog is and we know what a prototypical dog looks like. And now we say, oh, we saw this dog. It was large and it was brown and, and its tail was pretty long. In other words, we remember the prototypical dog plus the differences of the one we know or the one we see and we perceive, the differences from the prototype, okay? Uh, we see a, 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 some food, some ice cream. Well, they served us ice cream. You know, it was a big dish of ice cream and there was a banana on top, okay, etc. cetera. So, uh, or we see a face and we say, well, of course it's a face. We don't have to remember that, but we have to remember, oh, this one was beautiful. The, the nose was a little large or etc. cetera, okay? So what they are saying is that in order to represent things in memory, the way we do that is to represent somehow the ancestor and we're gonna have to derive the ancestor and the differences between the ancestor. And, and in terms of their theoreticians, after all, they talk about neurons. Well, these neurons are active or these synapses are active. Uh, that's what represents the category. And then the differences are represented in the memory. Okay. So similar inputs are encoded by compressed representations reduced to what is the category, frequent, prototype, mean object, and what is the difference of the novel object from it. Similarity reduces the amount of encoded information and the demand for synaptic resources. In other words, it's better to represent things by showing, first of all, what is their prototype, what is their ancestor, and then the differences from it, and that saves a lot of energy. But what does it mean in terms of our memory afterwards? We might forget the differences and remember only the prototype. We might remember, yes, I saw a dog yesterday, 
and not remember exactly which kind of dog, etc., it was. Okay. The mean prototype answer is inherent in the representation of each object. Thus, it's no surprise that observers remember the mean, the prototype, the ancestor of a set. There's no surprise that we have contraction to the mean, because when we're trying to remember all these circles, we remember the mean. Plus, yes, they were along the way, but what exactly we don't remember. Okay. So let's summarize once again. False of memory deriving from accounts given to others of our experiences. When we tell the story, we tell what should have been. We're telling something that's closer to the mean, to the prototype of what should have really happened. Contraction to the mean. We see a, a, a bunch of things and then we're asked about one of them. Well, they were all close to the mean or around the mean. So was this one. Memories form groups, says Kafka. Yes, in order to do this, we have to form a group and then remember the prototype or the ancestor, okay? If they weren't groups, then we wouldn't be able to do this. And ca categories are a prototypical kind of group. False memory of mean and prototype of a set of, okay, the DRM paradigm. Again, we hear all these words, we see the words that are read to us and we remember what was related to them all and presented with distortions of prototype. Illusory conjunctions. Why do we have illusory conjunctions? Because we can't remember it all. But if we're thinking of a carrot, then the triangle is going to be the one that's orange. That's why I gave you the words in, in order to do that first. Okay. And automatic unconscious set perception, including category, prototype, and shape, is also a false memory. And it's there because we remember the mean and then thing. And I always have to return to reverse hierarchy. So assuming that high level representation of population code mean and range is high level, then it's consistent with reverse hierarchy thing. We should first know the mean and range and only afterwards know the specific. Um, let's try once more uh, uh, another indication of this and I'm gonna contradict myself and say, looking at words, we also know the prototypical word. You probably know this. According to research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters of a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be the right place. The re rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without problems. And this is because a human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Okay, this is a very famous uh, example, but it's coming to show again, again the same thing, that even when we read words, we read them as the prototype of those letters, of the organization of those letters. And only then we can say, is, are they spelled properly or not? That's why it's so difficult to do copywriting uh, of an article, to find the errors, because we don't see them, okay? And uh, uh, one more thing to say here uh, is that this does not work in Hebrew, okay? Ram Frost has done an experiment with Hebrew trying to do this, and it doesn't work for the following reason. Somebody want to tell me why it doesn't work in Hebrew? Because Hebrew words are built on a shoresh, on a root. And if you confuse the order of the letters of the root, then you lose the word. And the first letter and last word are very often a prefix and a suffix to the root, to the shoresh. And therefore, this doesn't work in Hebrew. So take home messages, set mean range and category prototype boundaries, whether old experience categories or novel on the fly learned categories, all are extracted automatically and implicitly from an image or object sequence or array. Choosing one of two images as a sequence member, observe often observers often choose that closer to the mean prototype ancestor and perform better when reject the images outside the sequence or range. Perception of the mean, like perception of the category, prototype, or the shape ancestor may derive directly from representation of images, shapes, objects, words, and even scenes and events as prototypical or mean shape, object, word, scene, event, plus when there's time and need, the differences from the mean. So if we see many objects, then we remember each one is related to the mean, we remember the mean, and we might forget all the differences. False memories may be inherent in the need for perception to compress representation of so many elements. Mean false memories are not, they're, they're like all illusions. Illusions in general, the optical illusion, visual illusions are there because the mechanism is correct, is useful, but it's used in the wrong way for this particular uh, uh, test. 
right? Like, without like. In this case, false memories are there because it's the use of the useful mechanism, which is to compress representation. And it compresses by having the mean or the, and together with differences. Representing and remembering a thousand categories is easier than remembering a million objects and representing them. Thank you very much. I thank my colleagues and I thank you for attending and watching and listening. Thank you very much. I'm open to questions. Thank you very much, Shaul. Let's all uh, please unmute ourselves and give a big applause to Shaul. Thank you very much for a very um, intriguing and inspiring talk. And um, I'm inviting uh, everybody to unmute themselves and ask questions. I've got a few, but I'm uh, <laughs> letting others go first. Can I, Unger, can I ask a question? I'm not from the field, but just a general question. Yes. You said at the, at the beginning that this is not related to the false memory, you know, in, in, in the justice system and all of this stuff. But actually what you, what you suggested is that people would remember something that is closer to the mean and, and you know, regular stuff. So people have now outrageous you know, memories of something extreme that happened in their childhood. This should have been rejected, right? Because this is not in the idea of categorizing. Because what you, what you seem to create by this compactness is, is all the... All, Older, uh, orderly uh, uh, images or experiences, while the extreme stuff should have been treated in a, in a different way, not falling into your, your nice uh, theory, right? Right, right. Uh, you see, I, I, the, the thing that I think is that it's not extreme, okay? In other words, uh, we all have experiences as infants which are difficult. Uh, maybe we were hungry. Maybe uh, someone said harsh words to us and so on. And that is turned into something, you say more extreme, but maybe more uh, typical of what we think of now as adults. What kind of stress did we experience as infants? We don't know. We know we experience stress. And what is a typical just... kind of stress what? that we know about now is maybe someone hit us. Yeah. Sorry. Someone was saying? Yes. No, I think it wasn't relevant. Uh, Excuse? Sound is on? Come on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sean, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I have uh, one comment and one question. Yeah. One comment is that um, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with, but you didn't mention it. That the structure of a category that you are talking about is very similar to Ross theory of uh, the structure of categories. And you know, Ross theory of the structure of category that the membership in a category is really defined by the similarity and the distance from the prototype. So this is really a uh, very nice, it kind of converge with the uh, theory. Nice. And so this is one thing. The other thing is that um, how do we write to prototype? And this is something that if you assume, as you said, we know what the prototype is. Very good. Actually, it's a matter of a great debate in the literature and in the research, in research. And one view is that we write to prototype by exemplars. So we have to be, get very many exemplars in order to get to the prototype. So the question is, what happened? So all these photos, all these exemplars, one, once we arrive at the prototype. And this is really a question that thank I'm you, Thank you very much for, for both the comment and the question. So the comment, of course, you're right, that a prototype theory really is, is there that we define a category by its prototype and the distance from it, okay? Uh, by the way, the, the other theory says that we define categories by the boundary between two categories. And that has to do with our perceiving of the range of a set, okay, when we see a set. So it's also got a similarity to both the theories. But the, the second is exactly something that we're working on. The question of how do we form the ancestor or prototype by exemplars, by seeing many things. So that's what happens in our tests. 
we see circles of different sizes and we create the mean from the exemplars that we see. And, and of course, what we're working on now in terms of both the theory and the experiments is to see how is this done? Do we stay the first circle we see? Well, that's the prototype. Now we saw another one, we do the mean between those two. And then we see a third and we do the mean between, et cetera. How is this done? And so we're doing series of different lengths and cutting in the middle and seeing what happens until that point. Or a very long series with a different mean in the beginning and a different mean at the end and see how it develops and so on. So it, exactly right. Uh, and with the words, with the RM paradigm, we see a, a series of words uh, and they're all related to chair, but we don't have that idea in advance. It's only when we see those words that we say, well, they're related to chair. So of course, it's exactly right that we're forming the mean, the prototype from the, the exemplars, okay? And, and the only exception is the test that we did with categorization where those were known categories of uh, animal or dog or car or, and so on. So those were known categories and that's why they, they did better with those categories than with the on the fly amoeba categories where they had to derive them on the fly, okay? And once again, we're doing that in a series to see how they develop and how they can uh, set up the, uh, the mean. Thank, Thank you. you. Shaul, um, I want to ask if you think that it has to do with, uh, so it's maybe, uh, well, I don't know about false memories, but the idea that it's actually some sort of interpolation or completion effect of things that you haven't seen, but they are in the range of the, you know, like the blind spot or we do, um, um, mm. we have some completion effect. So that's why there are the things that fall within the range of items that we can that were um, the mean would be the best uh, possibility to complete, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and and of course things that are outside the range would be the easiest to rule out because they did not activate. Uh, let's say if I'm thinking about, about activation, they did not activate the um, yeah. the categorical okay. or. Very interesting uh, idea that you're proposing. That we see a set of things. And we don't assume that the set is complete, but it should be completed by other things which we were not shown. And therefore the things which are in between and especially the mean should have been there and wasn't there and the things outside should not have been. Uh, I, I think yeah. it's a, a wonderful theory that you're proposing and, and <laughs> <laughs> related to it, I think. Okay. Okay. Hi, Nurit. Yes, Nurit. Nurit, unmute you yourself, on please. Oh, there. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Shaul, for a beautiful uh, talk. Yeah. Uh, I have, again, a comment and a question. Yeah. Um, the question is, I was surprised that you didn't use at all the, the term schema in your talk. Yeah. And it feels to me that, at least in, in long-term memory, uh, a lot of the things you were talking about falls into this you know, schema literature, how we construct memory according to our schemas, how, to our prior knowledge. And in a sense, a schema is also, I guess, some kind of a, a category or a category representation or a um, average of many events or many scenes or many right instances mm -hmm. that are sort of averaged into one, one prototype. Do you agree? Yes, I, I think you're right that it's related to schema. Um, and um, so, uh, the, the, uh, with and the, we tend to remember schemas much better, right, than, than the specific yeah, instances. We right. know that. I mean, that's... Sure. Uh, the, the question is whether how schema theory uh, works with something that's done on the fly, okay, where there's no initial schema available, but we're going to create it during the, the stimuli. So we're showing this series. Of, that's why we use it, what we call the omebas. Uh, omebas. Uh, we're putting them up and, and you have no idea what's going to come. So there is no built-in uh, predetermined schema, but we're going to create it on the fly. So uh, I think that's a little bit of a differentiation, but I, I think you're right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. Um, okay. The other comment I was, uh, I, I think is important is that a critical factor in this uh, sort of on the fly or automatic averaging is that you have some kind of a continuum. 
because once you have, and this relates to what you said before about the borders between the categories, because you're not supposing that if I show you uh, a scene of, of let's say blue and yellow dots, okay, so I have two very distinctive categories, you're not supposing that people will false memory and say that they saw a green dot there, right? So uh, I think it's all about what you said, similarity and continuum that when, when we feel that things or we conceive things as part of one category, then the average would be the best prediction, also mathematically. It would be the best prediction for, for anything I saw there, right? Yeah, so, so first of all, the best prediction, uh, people have looked at this in terms of the Bayesian theory and, and to say that the Bayesian prior is the mean, okay? Uh, which might skew the, the decision-making, correct. Um, um, now, but not all the things are long, uh, First of all, a continuum, yes. We have done experiments having two groups, okay? Small groups, which can be amongst that or big groups amongst there, but none in the middle. And the question is, what are they gonna see? Right. The average, which some theories would say they should do, but according to the FUSI uh, theory, they should not because they're two different ancestors to these two groups. And that's what we're finding. People can find the mean of this and the mean of that, even though they were uh, presented interleavedly. It's certainly been done and known that if you put circles of different colors, you can do the separate means rather than the single mean and so on. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shaul? Yes. Uh, so okay. in the realm of uh, motor control, people talk about uh, prediction errors. Yes. So I'm curious if you find or if there is a parallel uh, so I have a category of movements and then the different exemplars would have a prediction yeah. error that would yeah. constitute kind of false memory. Yes, a prediction error. If the prediction error stems from some sort of experience, um, experience, a mean experience and so on, okay? Uh, so I have a prototype of my action. Of your action. Uh, one of the experiments is that you put a weight on their hand at one point and then they move, you move their hand the wrong way because you're predicting it without the weight rather than with the weight, okay? Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Uh, so um, now does that have to do with the mean exactly? Maybe, maybe it does. Uh, certainly uh, um, the uh, Georgopoulos theory says that it's many neurons which are giving the mean, getting your hand to move in the right direction. So the muscle is actually doing a mean of its uh, motor neurons in order to mm -hmm. uh, get to the right action. Yeah. Thank you. But prediction is certainly a very important aspect of this, yes. Yeah, in other words, um, mm, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Shaul, I have just another question. Um, if you think that uh, if you would have, uh, I mean, you did show that in the objects category, you get the same result, which is much more surprising to me than some things that are in a way meaningless to us as color or uh, length. But I'm wondering if you think that uh, if you have changed the actual category, say you've, you've uh, you would have tested faces or maybe faces with similar, um, um, if, uh, um, similar, uh, you know, um, uh, features or okay. maybe places, indoors, outdoor. If you would change the visual category that you're testing, do you think that this would have made a difference or you think that it would have stayed um, um, the same way? We use a, a tremendous uh, list of categories. They were also scenes, they were concepts uh, included, okay, and, and so on. So yes, we, we did a very big range of categories to do the categorization test. Um, and, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, I'll, and it's I'll replicating, it and it's replicating? And it's replicated with each one, yes. Wow. Okay, yeah. It's very interesting. Very interesting. And, and when we did the categorization, the question was, what's the prototype? So we did a separate test uh, where we said dog, and then we showed a picture of a dog and of some other animal, okay? And they had to respond to the dog. And then 
each category doing this and with each different pictures of different dogs. And the question was the speed with which they responded and the average reaction time of 100 subjects if the fastest one is the prototype and slower and slower as it gets further and further away from the prototype. Okay. I see. I don't remember, but I talked about it last year. Okay. <laughs> Thank Next. you, Shaul. I really wanted to ask how you found out that the prototype in your extension, yeah. how you knew yeah. how to present the prototype. So, Right, so it's, it's an accepted method in categorization that yeah. will respond faster to something that's closer to the prototype. So we did it that way. Now with our uh, amoeba shapes, we didn't have to do that because we, we defined it in advance. What is the mean and the mean is. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Shaul, um, you for a wonderful talk. Um, very inspiring, and um, we'd love to have you with us um, in the talks in to come class. this year. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I've you. Enjoyed, thank I've you, been everybody. Enjoyed listening to thank you very much. Thank, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.